See, the, the three laws mm -hmm. are horrible. They are a serious aggravation of the agrarian crisis. They are new milestones on the highway to hell. The entire agrarian crisis under the UPA, under the NDA. I will summarize for your viewers, 10th standard and above and below in five words. In five words, corporate hijack of Indian agriculture. On economic policies, the BJP government has been, BJP governments, whether the past one, on economics, they are the Congress party on steroids. More than 60%, perhaps more than 65% of all labor, all work done in Indian agriculture is done by them. In second part of the interview with P. Sainath, founder editor of the People's Archive of Rural India, speaks on issues like the alleged global conspiracy to defame India at global stage, government's role in solving and tackling farmers' problems and issues on women protesters, climate change that is affecting farmers across the nation, and the need for the implementation of the Swaminathan Commission report recommendation. Let's watch the second part of the interview. So you also wrote recently in one of your articles that uh, the government or the politicians came up defending and speaking against protesters, saying that there is international and global conspiracy to defame the defame. You know, it's, it's like we are in the middle of a Kafka novel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact, I think Kafka would have been baffled by the kind of stupidity that we are witnessing. As I said, global conspiracy, local stupidity. Yeah. So, now, so. you see, your country is apparent in the understanding of the government of India. Your country is so weak, so pathetic, that a rhythm and blues pop star and an 18-year-old schoolgirl activist and now a 21-year-old from Bangalore can run a global conspiracy and bring down the world's, you know, number one country on everything, which is what our, um, you know, narcissistic self-massage is about every day in the media. Now, are you so weak? Are you so pathetic that a rhythm and blues R&B star says boo and your country collapses? And accusing her of taking some $2 million for a tweet. A tweet which said, what did the tweet say? Why aren't we talking about this? It took no specific position on anything. And you're talking about a person whose portfolio, I mean, whose net worth is in countless billions. And you're talking about an 18-year-old uh, school girl activist. I'm not demeaning her at all. Mm -hmm. I think it's astonishing the kind of, and as I said, it looks to me like our 10th standard ones are, are going to save the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But I mean, just look at, you know, there is something extremely dangerous, neurotic and paranoid about seeing conspiracies in every difference until that point where any kind of dissent is criminal. And that is the stage where you already are now. Law, it's, and by the way, please, for, you know, for a moment, set aside the 10th standard students. Mm -hmm. This has been happening. To others in that age group, 20 plus to 24, whether in Jawaharlal Nehru University, in uh, Jamia Milia, in Delhi University, in Jawaharlal Nehru University, a bunch of gangsters, hoodlums, masked, come onto the campus, fracture, cause bone fractures, hitting the students' union president on the head, after which, of an FIR is filed against her for inciting violence. I said Kafka would be baffled to so, write this. Yeah. yeah. So, 
why do you think the government is not able to solve the problem or the word is the government does not want to solve the problem and also is this problem just because of NDA government or UP also is to be blamed not for this ongoing farmers protest only but for the agrarian crisis itself that the country has you're been very, you are very right you are very right uh, this crisis is not see the, the three laws Mm -hmm. are horrible. They are a serious aggravation of the agrarian crisis. They are new milestones on the highway to hell. But repealing these laws, which is absolutely necessary, does not end the agrarian crisis. Mm -hmm. It does not do that. It takes us back to where we were, which was never a nice place. Never a nice place because of a path of development that we have followed since 1991. Again, that mantra of reforms, except that the reforms are not for people, they are for profits. They're not for communities, they are for corporations. So from then, and uh, Shubham, please, my, my own journalistic record of covering the agrarian crisis will show you mm -hmm more than 200 reports which are extremely critical of the policies and actions of the UPA government. Yeah. Or, please pick all those pieces that I wrote in the Hindu, first as a freelancer, then in the Sunday magazine, then as rural affairs editor of the Hindu. And find me one piece which I wrote, which praised or was not critical of the UPA government. And it's very interesting. At that time, I was the toast of the uh, of the Sankh Parivar, which quoted me extensively with speeches in parliament, the speeches in public press conferences on what I wrote in the farmers uh, on suicide, on farmers' suicide, for instance. <laughs> Uh, the same people now call me a Congress agent. The number of pieces I have written critical of governments is far more uh, relating to the UPA government than it is with the present government mm -hmm. because I was a reporter in a daily newspaper then. So I wrote something very often. And, and I'm just saying, it, it, I marvel at it. Journals of the, the journals that used to quote me and say veteran journalist P. Sainath has slammed the UPA government and the Congress party for their fine. I, I actually did that and I'm happy they carried that. Now suddenly that is forgotten and it's made out to be a conspiracy against uh, everybody. You know, one, one man is standing saving India from a global conspiracy of maybe now spread to 100 countries, whatever. Why do they not want to solve it? First, they never thought it was a problem. They thought they will sneak it through during the pandemic and these guys can't do anything. When they realized it was a problem, they thought it was one they could deal with swiftly and they found that they were wrong. Why can't they remember it? Now, first and foremost, the entire agrarian crisis under the UPA, under the NDA. I will summarize for your viewers, 10th standard and above and below in five words. In five words, corporate hijack of Indian agriculture. Now, that is the aim. The power of corporations in agriculture increased hugely whichever government was in power at the center because that was the the ruling the ruling elite of india have embraced the path of neoliberalism and liberalization globalization in the neoliberal framework they've adapted adopted those policies and it's a question of let me put it this way. What makes this government then different? You can ask me that. Mm -hmm. What then makes them different? What makes them different is that 
on economic policies, for instance, well, on social policy, there are obvious differences on religion, uh, uh, society, etc. On economic policies, the BJP government has been, BJP governments, whether the past one, on economics, they are the Congress party on steroids. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> um, in fact, in fact, um, the, the one, uh, one of their own distinguished ministers and one of the more famous journalists this country has produced, Arun Shori, mm -hmm. said three years ago that the BJP has become Congress plus cow. Congress plus cow scaled up many times over. Those were his words. I think he got it right. So they have taken these same policies. They have also taken a number of laws and clauses from colonial laws. And instead of doing away with them as they promised they would, have taken them further, have strengthened them further. So yes, I'm saying as a nation, we have been on a particular path of development. This was initiated and put through by Congress governments and UPA governments, more correctly. Yeah, by UPA, Congress led UPA governments. The NDA governments criticized, the BJP criticized many of those policies. They were the most vocal on the issue of farmer suicides. They were the most vocal on issue after issue relating to multinational corporations and control of the seed sector. They were incredibly critical, you will remember, of FDI in the retail sector. Their own Vyapar base was so badly affected. Many of their leaders threatened to bring the playhouse down if this went through. They brought it through. Yeah. So I'm saying there is a continuity in that, but there is now a national reckoning where a number of people, including, I believe, a couple of people in the BJP are thinking, this is madness. Let's get out of this particular phase while we can. Yeah. So there has been a seesaw thing between these different political formations. Um, there, the fundamental principles on which they've acted have been similar, but in the present case, it's done with extreme misuse of law, extreme uh, misuse of uh, indifference to what happens to innocent people, mm -hmm. cracking down on a media. By the way, that crackdown on the media happened in much more in insidious ways. The criminalization of dissent happened very much when the UPA was in power. It's just been taken to such proportions that I say, this is the old policies on steroids when it comes to economics. So, uh, sir, there's one aspect in the protest. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. You'll be better suited to explain it to me and to our audience. That women protesters have come out in huge number. Now, Honorable Supreme Court also said something about women protesters and uh, old people at the protest site. Is it that women, women workers or women farmers in the agriculture sector have not been recognized earlier and now they are recognized? Why are they coming in to protest in huge number? It's not that I, they should not come, but what is that one particular reason that they are also coming out to protest in huge this, number? This question amounts to asking, why are farmers participating in farmers' protests? No. Yeah, <laughs> I hope you got it. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. Why are farmers participating in farmers' protest? Mm -hmm. More than 60%, perhaps more than 65% of all labor, all work done in Indian agriculture is done by them. Mm -hmm. The reason, sir, and, sorry to interrupt you, sir. So the reason I asked that earlier it has not been seen that women in huge number have come out to protest at such large scale. And they I have think, not, yeah. yeah. I think they have come out in larger numbers mm -hmm. than ever before. But they have come out before. Okay. But they have come out in larger numbers. I think, say, the women of Haryana coming out, that is quite unprecedented. 
on those on that scale on those numbers that is unprecedented mm -hmm. now the thing is they are also telling you hey we are also farmers we are the worst affected by what you're doing why don't you read that message into mm -hmm. they are saying we are the worst affected and they are please look at sector by sector of agriculture how many men have you seen do paddy transplantation more than 90 95% of all paddy transplantation yeah. are done by mm -hmm. who does your seeding weeding preparation of soil uh, dairings estimates of women in dairying range from 69 to 93% i think that this is a very positive and progressive development mm -hmm. that women farmers are asserting themselves and i've always said that you pl please go back you will find me quoted a hundred times on this i have said you have not a chance a hope in hell of resolving your agrarian crisis if you do not engage with the rights and entitlements of women farmers a decade ago professor ms swaminathan introduced a private members bill hmm? on the rights and entitlements of women farmers which lapsed it was never given a chance to be heard in parliament he was a member of the raj sabha it was never given a chance to be heard now my understanding is that if you ignore the rights and entitlements of women farmers dalit farmers adivasi farmers forest rights act all those mm -hmm. you have no chance of resolving your agrarian crisis the fundamental crisis the fundamental question before you in this crisis do you want as a nation do we want community led agriculture or corporate led agriculture whichever law you look at you will be dragged back to this question be honest and answer the government is saying corporate led agriculture and insisting that it is in favor of the farmers you can't be both so talking about so the... women farmers are coming out in very large numbers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. women by the way women farmers have been at the cutting edge of the best experiments in agriculture in this country like the kudumbashree movement in kerala where 4.3 million women including um, more than half a million women landless farmers are part of the world's largest they are the world's largest gender justice come poverty alleviation program hmm? and small farmers who were making very serious profits for 18 years until destroyed by climate change and the floods yeah so you have to you you have to look at the women's protests in the context that women have been the most active farmers in this country that they have had ideas and that they have created the world's biggest gender justice come poverty alleviation movement in which agriculture is a significant part and now they are coming out to say take back these laws mm -hmm. so uh, talking about climate change and the swami nathan commission you have written a lot on those things how is climate change impacting farmers not just globally but in this country and what should be kept in mind by formulating policies by the government of india or the state government again india has such incredible diversity mm -hmm. the innumerable agro ecological zones that it has indian it's not you know i i marvel when people say indian agriculture stands to be seriously impacted by climate crisis it already has been it has been very severely impacted hmm. now see in in india we have fragile mountainous ecosystem ecosystems we have coastal systems we have arid zones semi arid zones straight desert zones yeah we have huge uh, uh zones of you know major rainfall oh, we have forest zones we have an incredible number of zones 
in agroecological zone. The last half a century has been the story of our moving away from agroecological approaches to agriculture. What does that mean? It, see, people grew what made sense in their area. What now? Which state are you from? Uh, uh, so I'm from Bihar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, which part of Bihar? Uh, Patna. Okay. Now, in parts of in the parts of, in the Gangetic Plain, mm -hmm. people grew paddy. They grew rice, right? They grew they grew wheat as well, but they grew what was sensible to the soil of their area. One of the important principles of agroecology. We started in the last 50 years, we went in the direction of technology can override everything. Technology will solve, you know. See, Shubham, if I told you, I'm going to grow, um, I'm going to grow coffee or pepper in Alaska. Yeah, you would start phoning, you would start phoning the uh, loony asylum to come and measure me for a straight jacket. Yet, we have done something very similar in this country, growing sugar cane in drought prone areas. Hmm? One acre of sugar cane takes 18 million liters of water, according to the agriculture department. According to independent experts, 21 million liters of water. To give your viewers, and I don't believe any of them will have that number, what is 21 million liters of water? It's about eight Olympic swimming pools. Hmm. In that same 21 million, you could grow 12 to more, more than 12 acres of jowar or bajra or Indian cereals. Yeah. So in climate change, we invited climate change in many areas by a huge technological process that degraded the ecology, that degraded the environment of the region, that completely transformed the ecosystem. Give you an example. Take the Himalayas, where we are under doing incredible construction work in the name of development at very advanced rates, major roads, etc., which in fact provides employment for some of the people there who are being displaced because of that kind of development. It's paradoxical, but this often happens. The poor become dependent on the system that displaced them. Now, what happens there? Look at, there has been a huge amount of warming. As you warm it, India, by the way, has more pastoral nomadic communities than any other part of any other country in the world. We have the Chang Pass in Western Himalayas, the Brok Pass in Eastern Himalayas. Do you know, as it gets warmer and warmer, these poor people who are actually at the cutting edge of climate change mitigation, because they are searching and finding solutions on how to cope they are going to higher and higher grazing grounds. The grazing grounds in, in India, in Himalaya, at 19,000 feet and are the highest grazing grounds in the world, between 14,000 and 19,000 feet. Why? As it gets warmer, it's having a very bad impact on the yak. The yak is an extraordinary animal. The yak is an extraordinary animal which thrives at minus 25 minus can take minus 30 can survive up to minus 40 but if the temperature goes to plus 12 or 30 your yak is in serious trouble now also the kashmir sheep the, the kashmir goats from which you get your kashmir from which you get your wool what's happening is as the climate grows warmer, the yak are getting into trouble. Three years ago in uh, Sikkim, 300 yak died in a, in a space of a week. It made the front page headlines. 
Now that warmth, they are not able to take. Second, it's having a, an effect on their coat, on the fur, on the milk, on the cheese. It's having all that because they are adapting their fur. Nature is helping them adapt their coat to meet the warmer climates. <laughs> so there is a very serious impact on livestock, on livelihood, on the Likewise, you can look at fishermen, you can look at farmers in Anantapur, in Rayalaseema, in Andhra Pradesh, which is my home state, where we've created a desert in the southern peninsula, where in, in Rayalaseema, all those were covered with millets 50, 60 years ago. As we moved to cash crops, brought in groundnut, we repeated the disaster which lay before us in the Sahel in Africa. Completely destroyed that region. Yeah. So climate change is already happening. It's an extremely serious impact problem. Yeah. So my last question is, why do you think Swaminathan Commission reports should recommendations should be applied? And what is the solution? Not just for the ongoing protests, but for the agrarian crisis itself. You know, the Swaminathan Commission was actually the National Commission of Farmers. Mm -hmm. It took its nickname from the eminence of its chairperson, who is without a doubt the most eminent, most well-known, famous in the world, most world famous Indian agro-scientist. Right? So we call it yeah. Incidentally, please notice it is not just me or I or my friends who are saying go for the Swaminathan Commission. If in this country, in any corner of this country, if there are two English words that the farmer knows, those are Swaminathan report. <laughs> huh? Go back go back to Patna and ask people, they will your farmers <laughs> never take you. Usko lagu karo, Swaminathan ko lagu karo. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because that commission, set up by government, set up under due process of law, consult had the widest consultation. It didn't just consult think tanks in Delhi. It spoke to farmers' representatives. It had them participate in its deliberation. It went up. That's why the farmers are so keen on it. They trust it. Not what you thrust down their necks. Now, that commission spent three years. It delivered its first report. It, the fifth report was five reports. Fifth report had two volumes. Between 2004 December, when it gave its first report, and 2006 October, it gave its fifth report. And then it added a draft national policy for farmers. Okay, so it addressed the crisis as a whole, mm -hmm. not three laws. It addressed the agrarian crisis as a whole. It did so with the maximum possible consultation, with enormous research spread over three years, with total respect to the farmer's position while actually differing with farmers in several cases, despite which the farmers trusted because they felt that they had been party to the process. Now, for 16 years, those reports have lain in parliament without one day's discussion. In 16 years, you could not find one hour special discussion time on the Swaminathan report, which the government sought. Yeah. But you could find in three, four days notice, joint session of parliament to pass GST, which is a corporate device. It was meant to favor big corporations, which had nationwide operation and destroys millions of small guys, small people, who don't have that kind of operation to justify a putting a CA 
someone who will do your forms online, uh, setting up a whole computer system, filing your returns online. Think of yourself as, say, in Bihar, a collective of 200 um, weavers. There are, there are several. Their margin is so small. Now they have to take on a CA, a computer, a computer operator, uh, do online filling. What little margin they have you've got. They don't have national, huge national operations and offices everywhere. Right. So, but for GST, which was meant for corporations nationwide, that could be passed in in four days. You could in, in at short notice you could summon a parliament session. In four hours, you could pass the law with the president of India coming down in his special coach at midnight, like Cinderella, leaving us only with the pumpkin. Yeah, and um, this is what, but Swaminathan Commission, first of all, I beg to differ with this definition of expert. The first expert in farming, as Swaminathan always realized, is the farmer. Professor Swaminathan always understood that the first, and I'm not saying this as one who blindly follows whatever he says, I have major differences with him. But he always understood that the expert is the farmer. Right? And it is those farmers of Eastern, Western Himalayas, those pastoralists, the fishermen of Tamil Nadu, who are trying to find mitigation for climate change. While we are talking about COP in Paris and, you know, things that go clean over the head of your public and makes climate change seem very abstract and inaccessible to the lepers. The Swaminathan Commission report, what have I said repeatedly as, also, as myself, as a journalist and as part of the forum called Nation for Farmers, we have said that you need, and this is what farmers are also now calling for, we need a special session of parliament and of every state assembly to discuss the agrarian crisis and its related issues, rights and entitlements of women farmers, privatization of water, which is going on apace in the country back door. We need an exclusive, not a token session of three days, not like that. GST session where people came to rubber stamp the corporate wish list, but a nationwide discussion. And so nothing could be more democratic than asking that parliament discuss the issues of the people. Second, we could borrow and initiate a new democratic practice in India, which is pretty old in some other Western democracies, which is have public hearings on the floor of parliament where the victims of the agrarian crisis where the victims of the agrarian crisis stand up and tell the nation what crisis means to them instead of which what we are doing yeah, the Swaminathan Commission with 16 years the reports have been there which looked at the entire gamut of agriculture in this country you want to set up a committee by the Supreme Court. Uh, one fourth of the committee quits before the first meeting. Yeah. And in two months, they are going to do what the Swaminathan Commission, with the most eminent people on board, achieved in three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These guys are going to achieve in two months. Do you know the two months period? given to them to go back. They have put out a thing. They are taking a public poll. They are like Marg, you know, doing public polls. What is it? Give your suggestions. The people who ought to be talk, they talking, ought to be talking, listening to, are not willing to talk to them because they have no cr credibility and standing with the protesters. And in two months, by last date for submitting your things is 20th February, three days from now. In two months' time, they're going to find solutions to the crisis. Are this, is this committee so more eminent than that of the Swaminathan Commission? 
the only thing i know of in agriculture shubham that completes its entire cycle process in two months is the life span of insect pollinators okay that that's about <laughs> <laughs> yeah bees fruit flies oh, flies you know they between 40 and 60 days two months outer mm-hmm. limit is the life span hmm? and that is the life span of this uh, committee and i think that the committee and its uh, work will also have a similar the committee's work will have about they, they won't even have that 60 days of fame because no one no one gives them the slightest credibility Thank you so much, sir, for this long conversation and interaction with you. Thank you so much from the Logical Indian to you.